I uh, yeah, I, I wanted to um, as give a co-chair uh, welcome and thank you, uh, Dr. Rachel, for uh, uh, joining us this evening. Uh, the University of Edinburgh Staff Proud Network for LGBT plus colleagues and allies. Uh, for uh, to all our guests this evening, thank you for joining us. Um, the, uh, we have many uh, ways of engaging with the Staff Pride Network, which uh, Robbie uh, will, uh, if he hasn't already, will have popped that up there. Uh, my uh, pronouns are he, him. I am uh, looking forward to uh, the series of research seminars that our new uh, research officer, uh, Roland, is organising. Uh, building on Edgar's work, uh, platforming, uh, raising up the voices of underrepresented academics. Uh, and uh, we're really excited uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Rachel Cofield uh, to the stage. So I'll just give a little bit of an introduction, Rachel, for anyone who's uh, not read that. Um, so first of all, my name's Rowan, my pronouns are he, him, I'm the research officer, as Jonathan said. And, and this series of seminars aims to kind of bring together LGBTQ plus researchers both within and beyond the University of Edinburgh. Um, so it's really lovely to have someone who's not based in Edinburgh talk about their research so we can see a little bit uh, whether there are parallels or differences between our experiences as, as queer people. Um, we're performed by Rachel Cofield. Um, so Rachel's a queer geographer who recently completed their PhD at Florida State University. Um, uh, so thanks, so thank you for Rachel for, for giving up your time on what is a Friday afternoon for you. Um, so Rachel is an active member of several Association of American Geographers Speciality Groups, also an active LARPer, um, being the Director of Programs and Operations of LARPing in Colour. Um, and in this seminar, Rachel will be discussing their PhD research around um, queer ephemeral placemaking in Atlanta, Georgia. So there will be opportunity for audience questions. You'll see a little a button that says Q&A. Please type these questions in there throughout the talk, um, and then we'll have some questions ready for when we get to the Q&A part after the talk. Um, but if you prefer to raise your hand and speak, you can do that when we get to the Q&A section. So uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to ask Rachel to share their screen. Hopefully that works. Yeah. Can everyone see that? Be good to me. Awesome, awesome. So what I'm gonna do is go to my notes here real quick. Uh, good evening uh, to some of you, good afternoon uh, to some others, including myself. Um, thank you for spending your potentially Friday evening uh, kind of kicking it off, uh, listening to me uh, talk about uh, queer issues and my research. Uh, so thank you all for coming, um, as well as uh, super thank you to uh, Rowan and the Edinburgh uh, Staff Pride Network uh, for hosting and inviting me today. You guys are doing really great work. I'm excited to see more of it for sure. Uh, so my name, as you can see, is Dr. Rachel Cofield. As of April this year, uh, that feels quite surreal to say. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, but today I'm going to be focusing on a portion of my dissertation uh, entitled Without Place, a Dispersed Com Queer Community's Response to Gentrification. So my dissertation tells a story of queer life in Atlanta with concerns of homonormativity and urban land valuation uh, really at the forefront. Uh, I examine the ways that queer people make place for themselves outside of the homo norm and outside of the established neighborhood. So I began this project by asking about the kind of constraints and desires that shape queer housing decisions, uh, how queer residents engage in neighborhood practices of placemaking, uh, how they interpret neighborhood change, how queer geographies are uh, themselves reshaped by increasing suburbanization, um, particularly in Atlanta, um, where I'm going to be talking about, uh, where I'm going to be focusing today, uh, as well as the role of race, uh, sexuality, gender, uh, kind of uh, within all of these concerns. And so ultimately, I examine the relationship between gentrification and the ways that diverse queer residents imagine and enact their community and identity in Atlanta. Um, so today I'm going to 
be uh, giving you a little bit of context about Atlanta and Midtown to kind of start us off and hopefully get everyone up on the same page. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, the methods I used, a little bit of background, just a teeny bit about my uh, the other chapters that I wrote um, before really focusing in on the mobile and ephemeral queerness of the present moment. Uh, and I'll touch very briefly at the end on my future research plans and current research plans. Uh, and I'll close out with questions, which I'm really excited uh, to hear from all of you at the end. So let's go ahead and start some of that Atlanta context. Uh, so funnily enough, what I found, uh, and so I'm actually from Georgia, Columbus, Georgia, which is in Southeastern US. And uh, I'm actually from Columbus, Georgia, which is about 90 miles South of Atlanta. And what I found going in is that the context of Atlanta required this immense amount of historical unpacking, uh, really, a setup for understanding the queer, the, like the present, the queer present. Um, so I want to take a minute and begin unpacking the breadth of that history. We obviously won't have time to finish all of it, but I'll give you just a, the quick and dirty version and really hopefully bring you all up into this current moment. So Atlanta is the ninth largest metro area in the United States with an estimated population of about five, uh, almost six million, we'll go with that, the exact numbers on the screen, uh, according to the 2017 census. It also contains one of the largest queer populations in the country, with uh, just over 180,000 people identifying as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. And so Atlanta's queer population has historically exhibited significant urban clustering with an estimated 12.8% of the city uh, of Atlanta identifying as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, uh, which is the third highest estimated urban queer population by capita in the US. Uh, the city of Atlanta as well has the largest queer population for a black majority city in the US and it presents an important uh, place and context to explore and study the interrelationships between geographies of race and sexuality. Um, for terminology's sake, uh, uh, there's this colloquial uh, kind of understanding about, uh, uh, you know, how to refer to the region when you live there. So people in Atlanta uh, often refer to the I-285 boundary as inside the perimeter or outside the perimeter. Um, and this is going to come up uh, a few times throughout the presentation. So I want to give you, you know, a nice visual to kind of go along with your, your interpretation. Uh, I found that Atlanta is a really ideal study location to explore uh, the, uh, the very complex relationships between queer placemaking, gentrification, and how these processes interface with race, class, gender, and sexuality in a Southern city. So let's talk about Midtown. I want to briefly uh, touch on uh, the Atlanta neighborhood, uh, which is called Midtown, just to give you an idea before I move on. So let's start with the location. As you can see, it is very much ITP, so inside the perimeter. Uh, it's just north of downtown, uh, as well as just south of, of Buckhead. Um, there's some literature about Buckhead. Um, it tends to be a very uh, bougie area. We'll just put it that way. Um, this is a, a very historic area, but also where the Atlanta uh, Pride uh, happens every year in Piedmont Park. Um, and you can kind of see that outline on the map um, over here to the, the right. Um, so Midtown has seemingly always captured the local LGBTQ imagination. Uh, it's long held its status as a gay urban amenity and destination. Uh, it's the longtime home of various gay establishments as far back as the 1920s, though obviously they were very, uh, very much uh, need to know basis kind of establishments, right? Um, and it's still touted as one of the premier neighborhoods in the Southeastern United States, as well as one of the largest tourism sites of the city. Um, so especially things like Piedmont Park, which is a huge, beautiful park. Uh, and because of this kind of discussed size and scale of the Atlanta metro area, I often use Midtown itself as an example of the queer flows in and out of the city. Uh, and it's kind of a, a relational neighborhood stand-in. Uh, so I might, I might do that some uh, just to mix it up, I guess. Um, so 
My work very broadly lies at the intersection of two well-established fields of geographic scholarship, uh, urban geography and cultural geography. This is probably not surprising to those of you familiar uh, with either of those or have heard me talk for the last five minutes <laughs> or however long I've been talking. Uh, within these, I extend conversations uh, about queer gentrification, highlighting how scholars have gone beyond examining processes of economic displacement to address the loss of historic queer community. Um, and so I highlight how the lens of placemaking itself can be productively combined with research on the creation of queer neighborhoods to really understand the daily practices that create neighborhood norms and a subjective sense of place. And so thinking through queer placemaking, I stress the importance of thinking beyond a single permanent gay neighborhood or neighborhood uh, to recognize other practices through which many queer people in Atlanta engage in making place for themselves. Uh, additionally, I draw on mobilities in order to explain and discuss the transitory uh, and often ephemeral nature of the places created by this now dispersed queer population. Um, so to gain an understanding of uh, the relationship between queer neighborhood residents and this overarching process of gentrification, uh, I employed 33 long form semi-structured interviews uh, with 36 participants. And I also uh, uh, interviewed uh, four participants uh, in short interviews at Black Pride. Um, Midtown is also where Black Pride happens every year at different times, it's very hot. Uh, it's in July. <laughs> um, so these interviews really served as the core data for my project. Um, and interviews were semi-structured. They lasted between 45 minutes and three hours. So I had some very, people love to talk. Uh, it's good. I love to see it. Um, so these interviews asked questions about people's housing decisions, how they moved around, used different locations in their neighborhood as well as the city, where they felt comfortable, their perception of how their neighborhood in the city itself have changed over time, and as well as their perception of how the queer community itself has changed in relation to changes in the city. Uh, between these kind of scheduled interviews, I liked when they were scheduled. That was, it was rough. It was good. I loved it. Um, I also conducted participant observation. So during this time, I created like over a hundred pages of typed field notes on my phone. So many, so much uh, uh, texting myself uh, that really discussed my experiences I had while living in Atlanta. I'm actually in Atlanta currently too. So, uh, so yeah. Um, I employed a mix of approaches, uh, really uh, traveling, uh, commuting, observing, uh, in order to better understand the queer pathways and movements. Uh, so I went to festivals, uh, hung out in the places folks mentioned in interviews, um, as well as did tons of driving. Uh, Atlanta is not walkable. I'm sure you saw with the size of the city, it is not walkable. There are very few places within even smaller areas in Atlanta that are walkable. So a lot of driving and I'll get to that a little bit more uh, as we go throughout the talk. Um, so very briefly, I, I wanna just kind of give you a little bit of background on some of the other things I, I, uh, I talk about in my research before I focus in on the ephemeral stuff. Um, so other chapters uh, in my dissertation discuss urban valuation, the entanglement of family form and normative values in framing the Atlanta urban context and how this was tied to people moving to the suburbs, creating the OTP outside the perimeter that we saw in the earlier map. Uh, and within this process, we see the denigration of uh, the social and cultural denigration of the black family as well as the decreasing value of the inner city. Uh, and this was really something that allowed uh, gay folks to uh, buy and rent uh, ITP property, uh, particularly in Midtown itself. Um, so that is, of course, until uh, the 1980s. Um, and this is where you start to see a lot more investment being funneled into uh, the inner city areas. For investors, Midtown really represented, uh, especially after uh, many queer folks had come in and like 
built it up. This is a very common story um, if you're uh, if you're into this sort of research, um, but Midtown really represented this cleaned up area that could be easily turned into high rises, office space, condominiums for this kind of young urban professional yuppie group of folks, right? Um, and, you know, that's again, pretty common story. As I mentioned, it's right next to, it's right next to uh, downtown. Um, and as this trend continued um, and really, um, was extended by the 1996 Olympic bid, um, which started in the 80s. I'm not gonna go into that too much. Uh, this really entrenched a divide between those that could and could not afford to live in or near Midtown, uh, as well as a divide between the more socially acceptable homonormative gays and all other queers. And this was something that I found throughout my interviews as well. Um, and this created a kind of wide spectrum of effects within the gay and queer community, extending from this kind of full access by the rich white corporate minded gays and to the partial exclusion of many more than gays and queers. And so at the end, you have this, uh, this group of people that are best served by the new homo norm. And on the other end are those more than gay queers who have been most harmed by the intensifying gentrification uh, of ITP and now even OTP. Um, so this is really something that started in the 80s and is still continuing. Um, so let's go ahead and move in until um, kind of the meat of what I wanna discuss here today. So I uh, pick up the story of those more than gay queers that are unable to live in Midtown or who choose not to because of the price point or because they felt at odds with the expected homo norm. So I argue that they undertake a form of placemaking that is no longer contingent uh, upon a maintained physical presence, demonstrating an emergent queer geography that's unexplored in the largely uh, gay-focused scholarship. Though I, I do want to very quickly flag emerging lesbian and trans geographies as influencing my own. And there's a, a few uh, older pieces as well that talk a little bit about what I would consider uh, ephemeral practices that actually got gentrified out of even uh, places like Midtown originally. So instead, these, uh, these folks formed more home-centered pockets, often in apartment complexes or through temporary gatherings uh, of friends in the home. Um, so empirically, the, the emergent themes of this placemaking place are displacement, loss, commuting, and this creation of queer, uh, often ephemeral pockets. So, uh, gentrification emerged as a kind of unpleasant indicator of change and fear perpetrated by specific groups of people uh, uh, for the folks I interviewed. Uh, in interview participants, uh, in interviews, participants often identified a figure that to them represented a gentrified or a gentrifying area. The most notable figure was that of the Karen. And this is kind of a, a white developer and shopper who stood as an indicator of a, of a changing neighborhood. Uh, the concept of this like archetypical figure Karen was, sorry for any Karens out there, by the way, uh, was uh, quote the, the middle-aged cishet white housewife or soccer mom or something to this effect. Uh, and they're traditionally associated with a negative mindset, what we call the, I need to speak to your manager mindset. So for participants, this represented a kind of blatant soulless capitalism. And this appearance of the Karen acted as a kind of ominous harbinger of a neighborhood shift uh, and as an indicator that queer lives and homes would not be valued and protected. Um, likewise, it represented a, a control of a vibe uh, and the knowledge that sometime that someone was being displaced. Um, in re uh, relatedly, uh, there's a sense of placelessness. So in both my interviews and in my personal experience living in Atlanta, transportation and traffic in Atlanta are really integral to telling the story of dispersed queer placemaking um, in response to gentrification. As noted, like the metro area is over 8, 8K square miles. Um, and so there's this popular saying in Atlanta that Atlanta is an hour away from Atlanta. Um, as such, many participants develop relationships and connections in the smaller suburbs, uh, OTP, 
um, even as those places are growing at a more rapid place, uh, pace in the last 10 years as well. So queer people often express this frustration about a lack of physical locations that cater to them, uh, both in suburbs and in the traditional gay uh, neighborhoods such as Midtown. So many people, especially folks that didn't drink or that struggle with uh, the often hypersexualized aesthetic of traditional queer events in, in bars or in, at Pride. Uh, so for instance, like uh, people that identify as asexual or aromantic, right? Um, they discussed feeling placeless. And this was a very common theme um, among pretty much everyone I spoke to. Um, and I, you know, it, 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 it's not a point that I want to like, uh, I want to I wanna flag that, I suppose, that idea of being placeless. Um, so just we'll put a pin in that for a moment. Um, so interestingly, um, with kind of what I just said, right, uh, there was this lack of connectivity to traditional, more expensive neighborhoods such as Midtown. Um, the, there was this expressed inconvenience of Atlanta traffic and the lack of queer locations in suburbs themselves. So many dispersed queer persons developed smaller networks in the home, uh, the homes of friends. And so although many neighborhoods never attained a status above uh, generally considered queer friendly, it has not stopped many queer people from gathering in the spaces that they control, uh, namely the home. Um, so Christina Knowles, uh, a black bisexual woman born in 1996, explains her situation living in the suburbs and really describes uh, the multiple queer people living near her in her apartment complex, and she referred to it as a queer pocket community, um, which I loved. Um, and this idea of queer pockets resonated with many of my participants who often explained very similar living conditions, especially in apartments um, and in rental spaces across the metro area. So these people were managing to create queer homes even when the neighborhood itself was not queer. Um, and they would tell me whether they, I would, I would ask folks like, you know, is this, a, where are the queer places? What's your queer, is this neighborhood queer? And, you know, people would ask me, it would be like, no, 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 no. But my like houses and like this complex, I guess a little, you know. Um, and so they sometimes would uh, refer to them as outposts. So Honey, a white bisexual woman actually recounts her experience living in one of her previous apartments and she refers to the various collectives in the same apartment complexes along the even the same road as little outposts uh, where her and her friends could feel comfortable and these outposts served as havens and for her and many others in my study most socialization was going to other friends apartments for things like gaming uh you know hangouts whatever people do for fun um that has quickly uh, left my mind during quarantine <laughs> um so yeah uh and they were transforming these locations into queer ones um, and for these people, it was not the neighborhood level that felt queer, but instead the spaces that these people and their, their fellows were making for, with each other um, at the scale of the home. Um, so I want to I wanna take that pen back and say that it's quite interesting um, that people felt placeless, that they would identify as homebodies, but then they would describe this kind of rich tapestry they were building that was still place um, and place making that were really important to them and, and the way they felt things. And there's a whole conversation, of course, about you know, how COVID has mattered for many of these people. Um, that's that's a, a later date conversation, certainly. Um, so another example of place making is queer ephemeral space. Um, and so this was kind of an act of rebellion and validation where queers generated their own ephemeral public gathering spaces. Um, in particular, the Southern Fried Queer Pride was created to represent a more diverse group of queer folks outside of the homo norm. Um, this was kind of something that came about because uh, they felt the need to have uh, better representation um, in their own kind of pride, right? So this is a kind of week-long experience for folks. Um, and I attended nearly all of the uh, SFQP 
uh, organized events during my period of field work, um, including the opening night art gallery, uh, the hot sauce dance party, which there, uh, <laughs> so these, these are the kinds of things that are happening in like warehouses where there's no AC. And I will tell you that mid June in Atlanta, Georgia, there was condensation on the walls. So it was literally hot. Um, and uh, the queer thrift shop, which was super fun. Um, people donated and they collect donations and then they do this cool thrift shop idea. It's super, super rad. Um, so the opening night in particular left a lasting impression and I think really best represented the goals of the organization for me. So I wanna share with you my experience at this event. Um, so I showed up and I was kind of nervous because I don't know, I think every queer has the am I queer enough to be here feeling at least I don't know anyone who hasn't talked about that personally on personal conversations anecdotally. Um, so, you know, I was nervous and some people knew each other and some people didn't. And it's always awkward, uh, especially if I'm like, hi, I'm here to research you. Uh, there's a whole thing, right? Um, so I got there and I go in and they've got like Southern food, like collard greens and cornbread and little like sweet tea, cups of sweet tea. And all of this sounds really horrific to me uh, after a year and a half of quarantine. Uh, <laughs> um, and there's no air conditionings and they have these like uh, fans that you use, uh, like the paper fans with like their logo and everything on them. And so I arrived I, and I, I noticed this uh, in the art gallery room, which is a pretty fairly size, uh, fairly medium, large size room. Uh, they had art uh, up on all the walls and kind of like a historical narrative about their group and all this cool stuff. Um, but there was a white sheet in the center of the room, just on the floor. And there was a paint set up sitting right next to it. And I was thinking, because one of my good friends actually does body paint. And I was like, something's going to happen here. <laughs> um, and shortly, uh, shortly after that, uh, a black woman um, was given a mic and she began this kind of captivating spoken word talk about identity, accepting herself and her role as a community leader. And during her introduction, another woman approached and began prepping the paintbrushes. Um, and the speaker proceeded to undress as they're giving this talk. And she continues speaking while, and as the makeup artist literally begins painting a pride flag on her body. And all of the colors are running across like her chest and back and arms. And all of us had kind of gathered in this little area and were crammed together. And it was a very visceral experience with all of us quietly crammed into this small hot area. Um, and my, my friend picks up a, you know, the table, the merch table, I guess you could call it that was behind us. And she like reached over and picked up a fan. And so we're like, oh goodness. Um, but her talk was so evocative and really it spoke to this kind of intensity, um, of self-identity and finding her people and her way in life. And, you know, they had turned off the fans so that we could hear her and everything was silent except for her, her voice. Um, and this, this moment really stuck with me. Uh, I was taking notes on the ride home. I wasn't driving, luckily. <laughs> and I, I referred to this experience as evoking, uh, quote, a new tone of togetherness for us all as being intensely together, almost uncomfortably privy to the shared raw emotions of it all. Um, and there was this bodily experience that we had shared being mashed together in a cramped hot room without air conditioning. <laughs> um, and it was just filled with people silently listening to this speaker that felt expressly intimate. And so together we had shared this like experience that couldn't be replicated. And somehow this moment felt more meaningful potentially because it was so ephemeral. Right? Like I can, I can tell you about it now, but like, and I can feel the feelings welling up, but like, it's still very hard to convey. Um, and, and what I found is that these feelings that were expressed like by me just now were felt by others in the queer community. So Kevin, uh, a younger bisexual queer man who earlier, like I had, when I spoke to him, he had expressed this lack of comfort at regular, at the regular Atlanta Pride. 
also came away with a very strong impression of Southern Pride Queer Pride. He speaks of a, a genuine queer experience that gestures at this transient ephemeral nature of queer community gathering. And so not only does there appear to be a desire for an intrinsically personal and shared intimacy, but there exists a desire to utilize the collaborative space in ways that matter and uplift, right? Like uh, for many people, it wasn't like, they're not really interested in corporations like virtue signaling, like they wanna talk about who's excluded and why and what needs to be done. Um, and so regardless of this exact form of the ephemeral queerness, like house parties and gatherings, temporary bar takeovers, politicized burlesque dances, all of these experiences really demonstrate that queers are actively making place in new ways that are not reliant upon a physical ownership of property or a sustained corporeal presence in a particular neighborhood. And so these kinds of ephemeral gatherings provide like a means for those without a physical presence to make place for themselves, even if only for a short time. Um, and in the face of diminished access to more traditional locations such as neighborhoods or identity specific businesses, queer people didn't stop coming together. So, you know, the, instead they really I, utilized temporary avenues and rented spaces, homes, bars, what have you, to lay claim to space in ways that were often less visible and often uncharted. Um, so in this research, I found that even as queer people were dispersed throughout Atlanta and identifying less with the cor more corporate midtown, this didn't result in a total destruction of the queer ability to make place. Um, and so instead, queer people in Atlanta survive the gentrification that disperses and rejects them through taking back locations in a temporary way, as well as rescaling re queerness in the home through networks with friends and communities that reside in close proximity. Um, so, uh, that felt like a lot for that one slide. I, I am now realizing, <laughs> um, so, uh, for me, I, I think there's a lot of future research that still needs to be done. Um, um, very importantly, there are lingering questions about how processes of gentrification look for black queers in Atlanta. Um, and I think like future work, uh, can, and really needs to address how questions of gentrification uh, these questions of gentrification uh, are kind of coming about in a city that's still so very, very segregated. Um, so that is is one sure thing. And, you know, there are activists working on this, right? Um, such as Southern Fried Queer Pride. Um, uh, another thing I think uh, I'm working on now and in the future is actually continuing to build on the work of my dissertation, um, focusing on the ways in which bodies and performance entangle to actively create queer visions of place. Uh, in particular, I'm kind of extending my work into the burlesque community, uh, which was a community that I found to be uh, very, uh, in many cases, majority queer and politically leftist, particularly Metropolitan Studios that is ran by uh, three queer embodied folks. Um, and they're, they're really radical, really great. Um, and uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, can start actually doing performances in person again, um, uh, safely soon. We're just gonna knock on wood on that. Um, so I also plan to dedicate myself to a more thorough examination of Little Five Points. Um, Little Five Points is kind of like the cool grunge neighborhood, I guess I'd put it. Uh, and so more people talked about uh, Little Five Points being queer than like Midtown, right? Cause it still looks dirty and it's got graffiti, right? I guess those are queer things. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I think that this is a really interesting uh, thing that I got from, from participants because many of them also, you know, some of them were, grew up there, literally born right in and grew up there. And so they are telling me stories about how, no, it used to be way cooler. It's, it's very much in danger now. Um, and you can see that on the ground as well as, as prices increase. Um, so I think this is a kind of uh, very compelling transition neighborhood that may well be in danger of outpricing even the hipsters that uh, once called it home. It's very much a hipster neighborhood. Um, so I think that it, more work needs to be done that, on that front as well. Um, so as I stress, like Atlanta is so huge and the queer community is really complex and I'm really 
I'm really excited to carry these elements forward and continue to critically unpack what it means and what it is and what it can be to be queer in Atlanta in this, you know, segregated uh, Bible belt uh, that is Georgia, right? Um, so uh, I guess I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm near the end now, I'm at the end. Um, and so I, I wanna thank you all for listening. Um, and I would be super thrilled to uh, address questions or even just comments. Like I, I'm really, I'm super excited. So thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was really interesting and also very attractive slides. I really liked all your photos. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and uh, like myself as a geographer, I can obviously see parallels between um, Edinburgh in some ways, though Edinburgh is a lot smaller city than obviously Mount Antica. Um, so if anyone would like to ask questions, please put them in the Q&A or raise your hand. Um, and to start with, there's a couple of questions in the chat. So I will come to you now. So the first one is from George Simmons. And this says, how were interviewees selected and did you consider the potential impact of HIV slash AIDS in the displacement of Midtown in the 80s slash 90s? Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I started with uh, my initial connections that I had and I snowballed from that. So I already had some existing connections. Um, when I originally started, I was thinking like, oh, I'll, I'll talk to some of the queer local groups and like, I'll see if I can make inroads there. But I, I found that like a lot of those people are just completely slammed, right? Or they're larger organizations that don't quite fit with, I think, with what I was kind of trying to do, which was to really um, point to this ephemerality and like that I knew existed right like being a queer person in Atlanta and so like uh it was also just time constraints on in, in their their cases because like they're super busy people um so I really started uh with my own kind of uh network and then snowballed out from that um and I got a pretty wide array of folks I think um I think interestingly I didn't get quite as many uh, lesbians as I thought I would. So much of my community was very much uh, pansexual, ace, panromantic, bisexual. And so they were kind of along boundaries in a lot of ways, uh, which is obviously like something I was trying to embrace um, because I had to really like reconcile like, oh, well, I'm not going for, uh, I guess, uh, demographic uh, equivalency in any fashion like I, I just tried to embrace the group I had and I had a, a decent amount of older queer folks that I spoke to um as well as younger so like I I got different narratives like I mentioned the the little five points thing like someone growing up there um in the the 70s versus someone who goes now and see and like look like used to go there as a teenager that sort of thing um so I actually um did think considerably about the HIV AIDS um, uh, crisis um, in Midtown. Uh, so I wanna, I guess, flag a couple of things about that. Um, one, um, there is virtually no pre-1980s news coverage of any queer stuff. Like it is um, uh, extremely limited on what you can do archivally um which I found to be pretty difficult because most of the people I talked to I think the the oldest was in their late 50s almost 60 they might be 60 uh, I don't know time what is time uh, <laughs> um I was trying to think about when I spoke to them and it feels like ages ago um so uh so I didn't get too much about like you know being um actively involved in the 70s. So anything pre-80s was already very difficult. So that's, that's my first flag. The second flag is there is this debate um, and part of the major cleanup in uh, Midtown. Um, and this is something that is backed by um, uh, newspaper evidence and discussions, uh, as well as, as what uh, people said um, in interviews, particularly the older folks who lived through it. Uh, there was this focus on cleanliness and getting rid of the sex workers. And the people living in Midtown in the 80s could care less about whether there were sex workers. Um, and many, like there were a few outliers that I found that were like, oh, I don't really like that. Um, 
but it was very coded, right? Um, because there was this conflation between sex workers and AIDS and disease. Um, and so what a lot of the cleanup was, was literally rounding up homeless people, literally rounding up um, sex workers and just taking them somewhere. And I, I can't actually find out where those people went um, because they were literally picking certain uh, areas. Um, and I, I should have included a map for this, uh, but they, they literally included certain streets that they would target for this side of um, policing. And, um, and it was very much uh, in line with this rhetoric about disease, cleanliness, sex work is bad. Um, and I think that that very much was influenced by what was going on with HIV and AIDS. And I just think that the, uh, they were not making the connections uh, in a, a way that wasn't coded, but I personally felt like it was very coded um, for what was going on uh, in a larger context. Um, so I would love to like work with somebody like, I know a couple of um, uh, Aaron, um, oh, Aaron Mallory, Dr. Aaron Mallory, he, uh, I believe their pronouns are he, him. Um, they, uh, they actually do research on HIV AIDS and like kind of this medical um, struggle and medical access in Atlanta. And their work goes into that a little more. And so I would love to think more about that. So thank you for your great question. Uh, sorry, I, I might've rambled there a little bit. Um, so we've got another question that is from Zara Masid. Um, and so Zara says, fantastic talk. And do you think the shifting emphasis on temporary rather than permanent slash locational queer community spaces will make it more difficult to discover or build community slash relationships for those new to queer communities? And I think that's a really good question, Sarah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think there's like multiple layers to this, right? Um, I'm, oh God, I just turned 30. So I was thinking like, how did I find queer people? And I was like, oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I did talk to people who were, you know, 18, 19, um, and I think that it, it does, um, that it, it can very much make it more difficult to find your community in a city. Um, however, the second part of that is that the internet is so much more viable. Um, so a lot of people did kind of mention, you know, I didn't really know where to go, or I don't know where the queer stuff is. Um, but from my perspective, you know, they carry their queerness with them in so many ways that like, they might say that they were a homebody and they don't do queer stuff, like, or they don't know where the queer community is, but then they would describe a queer community, right? Like, so that they were finding it. It's just, I think the way that we think about community and spatiality, I think that people seem to be excluding their personal relationships in smaller communities um, or somehow thinking that they're not as meaningful in some fashion too. Um, so I think there's kind of a, an element of that, but I, I definitely see, uh, saw that a lot of like younger queer folks were like, I don't know where to go. I just like find the queer people at work. And then, because you know, you know who the queer people at work are, you, you find them like, you, <laughs> and then you kind of just like, kind of keep expanding from that, but it can be really hard. Um, luckily the presence of the internet is helping a lot. Um, especially cause like places uh, or groups like Southern Fried Queer Pride are doing so much active, like, Hey, we're doing this. Hey, we're doing this. Hey, join our virtual thing, right? And I think that's uh, that's really tough work. Um, as someone who has organized events fairly consistently over the last ten years, I uh, I empathize with that struggle so much. Um, hopefully, that addressed your question. Um, Thank you so much. And um, I guess following on a little bit from Zara's question, I was wondering: do people still use? And the people that you spoke to, do they still use the spaces in Midtown either kind of like half-heartedly or um, not at all? Um, I think fr from my experience in Scotland, it's kind of a case of, yeah, they're not great, but there's nowhere else often. So we still go there. Yeah, definitely. So sometimes, right? Like it kind of, it depended on the person. Um, so I don't know, I, I guess, I don't know, 
I'm realizing now I don't like internationally, this might be somewhat different, but uh, policing and uh, the open carry laws and guns are a big deal at events here. Um, <laughs> so people are increasingly um, aware of how that might impact them were they to go to pride. Uh, for example, or like if they, you know, because police presence at the the official pride does, it does matter and it does make people uncomfortable in certain kinds of ways. Um, so some people are very like staunchly, no, we should police our own spaces. Like, you know, we're allowed to have guns. So, you know, we should, you know, either make sure nobody has them or we should have our internal security. And so there's debates around like how to do similar things without relying on that kind of policing um at least the the specific state sponsored policing um so so there's certainly debates about that and there's uh, there are folks that are like no i would never go to any of those spaces because i know what it's like and i am afraid and i also like recognize that there's not really a trans place for me um but i also think atlanta pride um like deserves credit where credit is due um, and that they do multiple things. Um, and Midtown, you know, Black Pride is still hosted in Piedmont Park, right? Like, um, so like institutionally people are still using it, um, I guess organizationally rather. Um, but also like people do half-heartedly do the Pride thing too. And some people are more into it than others. Um, so I think it just kind of depends on your personal feelings about the matter, but also like your location as well. Um, Cause if you live an hour away from Midtown, the likelihood that you're gonna like just go to a vigil in the center of town in hella traffic is so low, especially if you don't have vehicle access. Um, and so even if it mattered to you that they were doing a vigil outside in Atlanta or in uh, Midtown or like Piedmont Park or something, you just might not wanna get on the, terrible uh, public transit and make your way there um, because the public transit in Atlanta notably does not extend all the way outside of the perimeter. Yeah, I think that's something that I've um, kind of realized from your talk that the vehicle access and public transport is so different um, and that really affects um, people can make space themselves. Yeah. Yeah, and some people are making it work without having a car, but it is exceptionally difficult to navigate Atlanta without a car. Um, and that was a pretty common complaint. Um, let's see, should I read this question or did you want to? Uh, I can read it. Um, so I've got a question for, uh, that says, do you think Pride and or community has been so successful in campaigning for acceptability that they have painted themselves into a homonormative corner and hence new movements, communities are needed to take up radical organizing. Yeah, so <laughs> that's the, the debate, right? Um, <laughs> uh, so, so you definitely nailed it there. Um, so my personal thoughts on this are that I think the work of organizing itself is exceptionally difficult regardless of where you're coming from. Um, so again, I wanna say like, like, you know, I, I know I said things like the like, hormonormative gaze, right? Like it's like, it is a problem partially created and well, I would say in large part created by capital and capitalism and not the kind of individual, no, you're, you're white and gay and therefore you're part of this problem, right? Like that's not in the way that I think about it. So like, I think like I have to, in some ways extend empathy for the people that have been enrolled in some ways, not for everyone, right? Like there's obviously individual things, but like, I think that it's very hard to, I guess, represent, first of all, everyone, right? Cause you can't, right? Like it, it's, you know, that's been the, the gay marriage debate for a really long time. Um, so I think that they have been relatively successful um, in kind of becoming more accepted. I think a lot of that does in Atlanta have to do with property ownership and like access to capital um, because there are plenty of poor gays, poor white gays that don't feel aligned with this, right? That still call out those gays, right? Like they have this kind of hierarchy in their heads and that's kind of trying, like what I'm trying to flag. Um, 
I think new movements and communities are always going to be needed in some ways, um, especially in an area so diverse as Atlanta, um, because like one organizing is already so difficult, but also just like I think new hands taking over certain things and do pulling it in different directions can make us stronger. Um, and so like, while I, I guess I, I might have uh, maybe uh, straw man the, uh, the Atlanta pride a little too much, right? Like as being like white and corporate. And while I do on a personal level have discomfort with that, I think it's also like, uh, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to try to walk that back. So yeah, I think in some ways they are definitely in this corner, this homonormative corner. That's a, that's a funny way to put it. I like it. Um, uh, and so I think that, yeah, new, new communities are going to be necessary. Cause I think like some things are just different goals, right? Like, cause pride to me reads more like get together and go woo. Um, but that was not the feeling I got from Southern Pride Queer Pride. Like Southern Pride Queer Pride was like, yeah, we we still got shit to do. And like, let's like have this intimate moment together, but let's not forget what things are about. And like, also it's not very corporate at all, I think. Um, so I hope that, I hope that addressed that. <laughs> it's a little rambly. That's a very lovely event uh, to go to as well. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, please do put them in the Q and A. Otherwise, I was my dog. Can I ask one? Yeah, yeah. Go on, Jonathan. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks very much for the uh, your presentation. Um, one thing that is huge for me uh, in relation to Atlanta is obviously the political changes and uh the senators and and so on um making the difference uh for the whole country so i wonder if you had any observations uh that related to that sure yeah um i obviously being a black majority city we're talking about uh the itb so within the perimeter area and that is the the blue wave area right a lot of the people that are um that are voting a uh, Democrat within um, within the surrounding suburbs, uh, there is this blue shift, but also, and, and it does coincide in some ways to people, the poorer folks being pushed out of the perimeter, right? Like, so you're gonna see that because, you know, some poorer folks are gonna be like, nope, this is obviously a problem, right? Like, so I think there's some kind of like cultural awareness going on there um, about where your alignment should be, though I will say that still the um, suburbs are still uh, more red uh, in, in a lot of places. Um, so you do definitely see that. I, um, I did my research in 2019, right? So, um, and I was writing um, uh, my dissertation in 2020. Uh, in quarantine in Atlanta. Um, and so like a lot of that was pretty rough. Um, but you also see uh, you, like uh, while I was here and this is again, kind of anecdotally in my own experience, there were groups like get them to the polls, like, uh, like uh, oh gosh, the, um, <laughs> I guess uh, there was a large amount of either sex workers or dancers, like exotic dancers and like strippers who were like, get them to the polls. Literally, we're driving you to the polls, right? And so they had these shifts, um, like getting people out. And as well as this was all happening, um, gosh, at the same time as so many of the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, uh, where people were literally just being picked up off the street. Um, so a lot of these kind of organizers I mentioned, like they were organizing internally, like the the uh, Metropolitan Studios, the, the queer burlesque folks I mentioned, they were like, hey, if you need to get out of this, per, like uh, out of this area, like we can get you out. Like, don't get picked up by police. Don't let yourself get kettled. Like, you know, here's where to go. Call us, we'll come get you, that sort of thing. And so people were using their proximity uh, to kind of navigate this very political landscape. And I hate to use that word uh, in this context, but, uh, you know, in, in Atlanta. And so I think like a lot of these are overlapping social changes, 
um, that requires more work. I will say that the Black voice has been marginalized in Atlanta in major ways related to capital. Um, so I think like that is really important. That kind of uplift is really necessary in uh, a city like Atlanta. I mean, everywhere, but like in Atlanta, like it's been, it's been rough, I guess the last few years. And so I think um, more exposure to that is gonna continue, um, I guess the, the blue wave. Um, so I hope that made sense. <laughs> Um, so we've got a question in, in the Q&A uh, and it says I'd be interested to hear a little more about less corporatized um, like mainstream crowds but still businesses or physical spaces in Atlanta such as gay bars and how those impact queer community feeling. Um, I've heard Atlanta has a thriving drag scene for example. Yes, they do. They do have an amazing drag scene that is often that is often uh, very black led um so like major props there because this the stuff the output is amazing i'll just put it that way um so uh in terms of like the first part like less mainstream prides um uh in my experience for, with uh southern fried queer pride it was more like there were some money exchanging hands kind of things all of these events were free they were donation based. So if you wanted to pay, awesome. And if you didn't come on in, we're still gonna feed you and give you, you know, cold water that you need uh, <laughs> uh, for health reasons. Uh, <laughs> but you were not turned away, for instance. Um, they also had like vendor booths for local artists, right? So you could go and you could talk to artists that were there. Um, and so they would come and like set up some wares and stuff, um, which, you know, does have a, a transactional uh, uh, element to it, but it is definitely not like, it's not like buying your pride stuff from um, Target, for example. Um, and in my own experience, like of being like an event organizer, like if you're selling t-shirts, you're probably not really making money off those t-shirts. Uh, so you're, you're doing it to celebrate um, for the most part, because you don't really make money off of selling t-shirts. <laughs> They're a fun thing, um, and that kind of merch is fun, but it's not, it's not a, uh, it, it is not a money-making endeavor, um, and th these people deserve to have, have their spaces for sure. Um, sometimes they are still in, uh, things like gay bars. Um, the, the one I went to was actually at, um, Ooh, the name is escaping me. The bakery. It was at the bakery, which is like an art collective thing that operates out of a temporary warehouse. Uh, it actually has a different location now, but like there is this kind of precarious uh, rental situation because uh, the one that the one that I attended actually is in a place that I think got shut down. Um, the next year and obviously COVID has mattered in terms of like what has shut down and what has not, uh, particularly for places like lesbian bars. I think there's like 16 surviving lesbian bars in the entire United States, which is a criminally low number. <laughs> um, and Atlanta actually still has theirs, um, my sister's room. Um, and it's a really cool, it's a really cool establishment. A lot of the queer burlesque stuff would go on there. Drag shows are going on there. Um, and so I think people like having those spaces. It's been weird during COVID um, because so many of the people involved are lefties, you know, and they're not, they're not science deniers. They're like, nope, don't want to get COVID. Gonna stay home until it's safe. We can just do cam stuff. It's fine. Uh, and so there is major safety concerns and considerations as well. Um, I think, like, I guess queer community feeling is that there's still an accessibility issue to going to bars and drag shows. Um, some of them are for profit, like, you know, you pay at the door, that sort of thing. And many of them are still. I'm trying to think if there's actually any that I've seen that are outside the perimeter. So driving there is still a pain in the ass. Uh, finding parking is a pain in the ass. Like, so you have you have this kind of, it cannot, do I have the money to go and do this thing, right? Because if you're going out, I would say that there is a thriving scene, but like if you're poor, you might,
might weigh that in your mind and say, I support this, but I can't really engage with it. Uh, whereas I think things like that are free and by um, very much a, a seasonal tend to be a little more accessible sometimes because people can plan around them, uh, especially when they're free, like Southern Pride for Pride. Like if you, you want to go to a dance party and it's free and there's a DJ and music and things you like there, like gigantic pride flags like you're you know you, you might feel more inclined to do that you, you might at some point make the choice like oh well I don't drive but I can carpool so um it's very layered I would say um and it very much is uh implicated in this relationship with capital um and land value yeah um I think I, I was I was also wanted to ask you um I guess what were there any like, factions could be used kind of queer and community as, as terms quite a bit? Um, were there any things that you came across that that seemed like particular people or groups of people um, preferred certain areas? I'm thinking a little bit of kind of Jack Iskin's work, um, kind of on lesbian and trans people's experience of the city. Yeah, so <laughs> I think that, sir, that Little Five uh, points was an area I, I did see a lot of affinity for. Um, I think people like the kind of kitschy, weird areas in general, right? Like if they're going to go out, they want to go to the place they really like because it is otherwise expensive. Um, I did note that there is a kind of historical affinity for Midtown still, right? Like that didn't go away. People people still know what the neighborhood is. Um, and I, I just think that like, you do kind of get priced out at a certain point. Um, in terms of specific areas for like specific groups, I didn't find too much on that. Now, obviously like my, 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 si uh, my pool, was pretty small. And so that's something that like, I could certainly delve into more. Um, uh, there is this idea that Decatur is for lesbians. Um, and I think that just, I, like it has to do with like the historical lineage of where people bought and rented homes, right? And as they moved, they were getting pushed out, right? Outwards. Um, so there is a little bit of that. Um, but again, I'll just more data needed. Uh, and also there was a lot more centrality on, uh, but there is this kind of new affinity for smaller like neighborhood squares. So things like Marietta Square, uh, uh, you know, this, this kind of like small town uh, neighborhood square kind of idea that was coming out. Um, and so people would go there and be like, oh yes, so I go to get my ice cream there and my, my boba tea and walk around and then I go home. Uh, <laughs> uh, so there, there is some of that, but I didn't get too much like into the specific groups, like specific areas. Cause I, I definitely, um, in my experience, a lot of the groups are so overlapping, um, particularly when it comes to uh, bisexual, pansexual, um, gender fluid. Like, I think that that makes it more complex in a lot of ways because people, and, people will self-police themselves out, right? Like, so like bisexual women in particular talked about this a lot or like bisexual femmes, I suppose, um, is more accurate. They would police themselves out of lesbian spaces or places they thought were lesbian spaces or like, you know, lesbian dance nights, for example, right? Um, which again, there aren't too much of that, um, but people, people definitely will police themselves out if they have um, a, a different sex partner uh, at the time. Um, so there's this very interesting like kind of external policing, self-policing, and then like just kind of being more attracted to places that are nearer as opposed to farther. Um, but yes, more, more of that is going to be, that is a, a forthcoming sort of uh, question. So thank you so much for asking. Yeah, it was really it was really nice to see um you discuss a little bit about your future research as well because it's always nice to, to to kind of see where you you plan on going with it yeah um, but we do have a question here how racially integrated was the scene in atlanta and how has this changed over time um so uh i think i kind of mentioned like 
more work needs to be done on the on the race front for sure. Um, my dissertation and like kind of, I was very influenced um, when I I so I'm a I'm a trained historian. I have a master's in history, and I wrote about Southern identity and. Um, a race was very important to these considerations. Um, so my background is very race influenced, um, race scholarship influence, you know, like Catherine McKittrick and uh, a lot of newer folks and like black geographies in general. And so I really moved from this kind of more Derek Alderman, uh, like landscape, thinking about place and landscape and memory into this kind of more cultural geography, urban geography. Um, that was very, very queer. Um, and so like, but I have been very um, aware of uh, race being something that really needs more, more attention in this matter in particular. Uh, that being said, um, it was not particularly, like if you were gonna go to like Midtown in the seventies, um, it's again, it's a little hard to get clear uh, details about that, right? Because if you're looking at like demographics, uh, demographic transitions and stuff, like a lot of it isn't particularly well integrated, but also like, what do you do with the homeless population that they literally just put on a bus and drove somewhere? Um, and so I found a lot of gaps in how we, how we use and acquire data about race and sexuality and gender. And I'm sure like many of you are aware that like, we just don't track that in the US census. Um, and, you know, people have tried to put things together, but a lot of that's old. I'm actually working on a piece that hopefully will speak to a lot of that a bit more. Um, so I would say in my personal experience um, from black participants, uh, the scene has been uh, in some ways racially integrated with on the more radical side particularly in more of like the drag trans uh, side of things. Um, I guess the cool kids as it were. Uh, <laughs> and, and that that people did kind of lament how this very corporate white bodied uh, gay man kind of changed that in some ways um, because I did speak to uh, one, one individual in particular who was very much like, it really sucks. And like, you know, I, I'm, I'm black and I, I'm aware of these things and I was there when it happened and like there was something lost. Um, so what I got from participants um, was that there was this kind of, in some cases it was more, I guess, racially diverse. And in some cases it wasn't. I think over time, the, like the more, I hate to, hate to pigeonhole it this way, but the more like, Homo normative has become a little bit more integrated, um, but I, I wouldn't say that this is necessarily a trend, given that you have these like emergent like, I, alt spaces almost alt groups uh, like like Southern Pride, uh, Pride queer pride um, that are very much uh, people of color led. Yeah, I think. Um... Well, for me, at least doing my own research, it, Atlanta seems to be a very different place to where geographies have previously focused on, which were mm -hmm. usually majority white. Um, but I, I wondered, are there any other cities that you might like compare your research to or that like seem similar to you? Yeah, um, so part of what, I, what drove me to do this was that like kind of, uh, I guess, focus on Northern cities that you kind of, gestured at like right like New York City like things that we're going to think about as traditionally queer or gay or what have you um and to me I didn't find those particularly resonant because it's kind of like understood that when you leave Atlanta you're in Georgia um, and then that means something to people like it means something to queer folks right like you don't you start going to places like Woodstock, you're not in Atlanta, you're starting to leave Atlanta and you need to turn around, uh, you know, and I, again, part of that is influenced by race, but like, um, part of it is like, it doesn't feel like a city anymore. And I think like a lot of the surround, like the, the huge area that, um, the metro area of 
encompasses is more urban feeling. I have I have feelings about ordinary cities um, and like how important they are. So I think like there are other towns that I see a lot of similarities aren't that aren't specifically like gigantic cities. Like if I was to look at like um, like Chattanooga, which is in um, which is kind of like a yuppie, cool, burgeoning uh, city in Tennessee, um, like places like cities in Texas, um, and uh, like maybe even like other black majority cities as well. Um, I think that they're all pretty under focused uh, or under emphasized in terms of like queerness. Um, and so like maybe something like Baltimore uh, could be really interesting to look and think about that because um, they also have their own uh, neighborhood, um, which the name is escaping me at the moment, um, uh, but it's like where divine and uh, Oh gosh, forgetting the the movie uh, the the director. But uh, regardless, like there is this kind of rich background there that I think would have similarities. Um, and the southeast in general has terrible public transportation, <laughs> which definitely makes it very different from somewhere like New York City, where you can get around without a car. Um, here you don't uh, you don't want to try. Um, so, so I guess in my mind, I was thinking about these ordinary, this ordinary cities concept and like the Southeast and like other smaller medium sized cities, though Atlanta, I think is pretty big. Yeah, it's really interesting to see kind of a different take on, on things, even for myself, who doesn't really know that much about the US. <laughs> a question from Fergus Ryan. And Fergus says, thank you for a wonderful talk. Very interesting indeed wonder whether greater visibility and acceptance for at least some LGBTQ plus populations relative to the past has opened up formerly straight spaces by diluting the importance of queer spaces, i.e. less segregation between queers and straights. Um, yeah, I, I think in some, some cases that it has uh, maybe done that. Um, I think for some people that that is enough. Um, what I found was that for none of my participants, it was enough, I guess. Um, now, I, I, I guess I'll, I'll mention that uh, for people like, um, like Metropolitan Studios uh, that kind of moves their performances, they have their own like studio, but they also, um, they also do performances in different spaces, right? Like in different venues, like um, music halls, those sorts of things. Um, so like they are explicitly taking a lot of care to under like find out what the safe venues are, right? Like who are, because you know, there are people that love the money that burlesque can bring in, but like if they don't also love the queer burlesque, then they're not gonna go there, right? Like they're not gonna go to that you know, normal straight bar, right? Or, or a music venue or whatever. Um, so they're actively like as organizers being attentive to like the ownership and that sort of thing um, when they make those decisions. Um, so I think in some cases, yeah, that is the case. I think like if you live OTP, you're probably not going to, <laughs> you're, you're not going to a, a gay bar in the suburbs. You're just not. Uh, <laughs> but you might go to somewhere like, a gamer bar um and they have those here so like you might go to like a cool like oh they're doing tabletops and video games everywhere bar and they have their own pride night which i also went to uh <laughs> so you might go to something like that and because the um the businesses and the ownership has taken like actual steps to be like hey we support you like and we're not going to let people bully you here like that that has mattered um and there are bookshops as well like uh though those are uh increasingly um having problems uh, maintaining their own footholds as well uh for various reasons um so i i would say that there is a lot of a lot to be said about like using uh straight spaces right and changing them transforming them into queer ones which is what i'm writing about with the uh the burlesque but i at the same time I think that people still value like that that the queer spaces, especially like the uh, the ephemeral ones, like the one at Southern Pride Queer Pride, the ones you're having in your houses with your friends down the road, that 
those were very obviously incredibly important to the people I talked to, right? Um, so just for from what I got from participants, like it was still very important that they had those explicitly queer and queer influence spaces. Um, so yeah, I definitely think there's something to be said about the dynamic between people saying that they were home buddies, but then they would tell me all these places they would go to. Uh, it was quite interesting. And I'm now I'm like, would I have said that in an interview? Probably. Uh, <laughs> so yes, thank you for that question. I think it's really interesting the fluidity of straight versus queer spaces, but it's not something that's new. It's something that's always been there. It's, mm -hmm. so, for example, kind of like gay bars often started out as straight bars, having gay nights, that just became a full-time thing. Um, mm -hmm. Really and yes, it is John Waters. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. It's been really lovely to have you here um, and to hear about um, a, a different place when we can't travel to anywhere new. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think most people are familiar like internationally or, or uh, <laughs> I guess uh, I would say um, uh, familiar with Atlanta by its horrible airport. <laughs> Um, and uh, I can tell you that the congestion in that airport is completely emblematic of the, 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 the surrounding traffic as well. It's just, it's, oh, and we I hate have going to Atlanta Airport. A quick final question from Shamal, um, and it says, would you like to elaborate more on gay pockets? Yeah, I can, I can talk about that a little bit more. Um, so again, uh, I was kind of bummed because like so much of what I've had to look at was really like starter stuff for things I want to build on more um, because as the context of Atlanta was so gigantic and encompassing, I really had to start in a place I didn't want to study, right? Like I had to understand Midtown to get to the damn thing I want to talk about. Um, and I think that's like so much the frustrating work of how you do research and dissertations uh, in particular, right? Because uh, I really, you know, I want to, I, I really want to talk about these gay pockets and like ephemerality and like really talk about that transient stuff. But I had to start with all this other stuff. <laughs> um, so in terms of gay pockets, um, I, can, I guess I can give you a little bit more on like how people defined them. Um, so people talked a lot about being renters in like apartment buildings. Um, and so apartment buildings, you know, you, you sometimes you have the lettered buildings, right? And then you have like however many like flights. Um, sometimes you have like the three stories and then like you have like, I don't know, 10 units or 12 units in the same little building and then you can go down the sidewalk there's another building same thing um so people would talk about like oh yes uh the lesbians that live two houses down they i know that they're lesbians they know that i'm you know not straight uh i see them getting their groceries and walking their dogs and like oh the guy down there like he's definitely like gay and like we you know we pass each other and we know even if we don't actually like actively hang out um or it would be like commune tile stuff where like you know uh, a bunch of friends or folks that like kind of knew each other tangentially would rent in the same complex or the same like building unit or whatever um and so you could kind of just like go from one to the other depending on where you wanted to hang out and like if anyone was having trouble with rent which everyone is always having trouble with rent, Atlanta, just Atlanta, um, explanation, um, uh, you know, oh, well, if you're having trouble paying for yours, we can, you know, give you some money, and then, like, you know, you can, uh, you can just pay us back later, right, like, it's all very communal, and, like, even if there weren't direct associations, like, you know, mentioning the lesbians two houses down, or two units down, or whatever, like, you, you would, you would kind of get the sense that they understood where the queer, the, like that they were in a pocket um, within this larger context of being in a suburb that was not queer, right, or gay. Um, so I, I, yeah, that was, I hope that, I hope that elaborated a little better kind of what I was getting out there. 
I really like the term apocalypse. As yeah, like me too. Mafia. Thank you to Mal for your, for your response there. Mal says similar pockets in Mumbai. Oh, awesome. That's so super cool. I think uh, it's about time to wrap up. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, and it's been a real pleasure to, to speak to you about your research and to hear more. And I, I wish you all the best for, for carrying on. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. For um, attendees, Robbie has put all sorts of links in the chat for how to follow the Staff Pride Network. Um, and there's also a questionnaire to fill out and that would be really helpful if uh, people could do that. So we can use that feedback to plan future events. Um, and if you'd like to discuss your own research in a seminar like this, um, you can contact the Staff Pride Network. Um, so thank you so much for attending and thank you, Rachel, for talking about your research. And I really hope that everyone has learned and enjoyed your presentation. It was really beautiful. Um, yeah, it was just so nice to like see um, where you've been and your participants and, and all sorts. So yeah, thank you so much. Please yes. do join us for future events. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'll definitely be following and and keeping an eye because you guys are you're doing cool stuff. Good thank work. You. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Rowan. Thank you.